Hello and welcome to How to Start Up, a podcast for anyone starting a company. This is a collection of conversations with people who have all successfully started, run and even sold their own companies, sharing not only professional but personal experiences on what we should be doing now, next or never. Hosted by me, Juliet Fallowfield, founder of PR consultancy for startups, Fallowfield and Mason. Given many founders are experts in their particular fields, but not when it comes to the more technical side of things, I wanted to create this mini-series that provides listeners with a practical checklist covering all sorts of topics including accounting, legal, HR and recruitment, as well as investment. This all falls under the umbrella of I don't know what I don't know. And given when you're starting out, you have so many questions, I hope to answer a lot of them for you here. However, of course, there are always more, so please don't hesitate to leave your questions at the SpeakPipe link in the show notes. In this episode of the mini-series of How to Start Up, entitled I Don't Know What I Don't Know, we cover the legalities of starting a company. Helen Gerard left her career as a city lawyer for the French Alps, where she started Snow Drone with her husband, and continues her legal work for Ignition, a law firm which specialises in supporting startups and their growth. Helen shares advice on how and when new founders should approach the legalities of starting a company and that with the right support, it isn't something to be daunted by. I was really keen to speak to Helen as she's not only a lawyer supporting startups, but also an entrepreneur herself. Plus, she has mastered work-life balance, given she uses time on ski lifts for her conference calls. Hi, Helen. Thank you so much for your time today on how to start up. It would be great if you could give a brief introduction as to who you are, a bit about the company and yeah, your background would be great. Yeah, my name is Helen Gerard. I am a lawyer by trade um, and still I'm very much a lawyer. I'm one of the partners at Ignition Law, which specializes in startups and scale ups across a whole range of sectors. But I'm also an entrepreneur in my own right. And six, seven years ago, my husband and I started our own company called Snow Drone Transfers, um, which is an airport transfer company with a head office based in Val where I live. But we operate in the, um, the Tarentaise region of the Alps and also in uh, Biarritz and the surrounding areas. Amazing. And that's so interesting because I wanted to talk to you about sort of the legalities around starting a company, but the fact that you've also started your own is brilliant because you can see it from both sides of the fence as a lawyer and as an entrepreneur. The first question I had for you around this was at what stage did new businesses and founders think about the legalities about running their own company? That's a very good question, actually. And you'll be surprised at how many people think they can get away without legal advice for many years. But the short answer to that question is, ASAP, I would actually take it right at the outset before you've even incorporated the company, even if it's just to have a conversation with a lawyer. Because what we often do at Ignition is, you know, we will have an intro call with you just to get an idea as to what you're doing, um, what kind of business you're starting, you know, what your your key goals are for the next couple of months and beyond. And then we can give you some advice as to what the next steps would be and what are the key things what are the not so key things the ones you can leave for a little bit longer and I would really urge people to to do that as soon as they they have an idea the reason being is we have a a portion of clients that come to us at a certain stage where they've been trying to do the legal side of things themselves and actually what they've ended up doing is completely making a mess of their filings on Companies House and it actually takes us a long time to unravel what they've done, try and piece it together and then get to the position that they need to be in and correct everything on Companies House. So actually it ends up costing them more money for us to rectify everything. So it's better to start with a clean slate. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. And it's not just from a legal perspective. The things on Companies House also need to be correct from an accounting perspective as well because when your accountants come to do your your annual accounts, they'll need to make sure that the share capital shown on Companies House is reflective as to what has actually happened with the accounts as well so important to make sure that everything is correct and right from both perspectives thank you that really helps because I'd assumed it'd be incredibly complex and expensive to start a company and this sort of unknown was probably the main barrier for me to not leap sooner and I was wondering if you could talk through what there is not to be scared of or not to be put off by yeah I think a lot of people get put off by all the admin side of things that comes with running a company but actually if you understand what it is you need to do some of that you may be able to do yourself or with a bit of guidance but actually quite a lot of it we can take away from you the same on the accounting side many companies recognize the fact that when you're starting out you don't have a lot of money to play with you know margins are very tight I know that myself having a business in France and France is actually 
way more expensive than England in terms of starting a company and dealing with the legal and accountancy side of things. And what we do at Ignition is we have a company secretarial team that basically help you manage the company legality side of things. So for example, what a company is required to do every year is submit a confirmation statement to company's house. And that's basically a statement of key things about the company, including its shareholders and how many shares each shareholder holds. And that's something that our company secretarial team can just do for you for a very reasonable fee. And we get a flag on our system as to when it's due. So we kind of contact you to remind you that it's due. And it kind of just takes that heat off you trying to remember it. Because when you're starting a company, you've got so many things to remember. And actually, your focus is trying to generate business for the company and develop the business. So if some of the boring admin stuff can be taken away from you, then I think that's a great thing. And the support, you're right, with the juggling of hats and the, in the theme of you don't know what you don't know, having someone who's an expert to prompt and nudge and preempt those problems has been a massive support and you can sleep at night. Exactly. And the accountancy podcast that you did, I'm sure the same message would have been relayed there that, you know, if, if you've got somebody that can take PAYE, the VAT return submission off your hands, it's just a bit easier. <laughs> And in the theme of now, next or never, is there anything you suggest new founders should think about first from the legal side? Are there common mistakes that new founders often forget or make? Yeah. So quite often founders will just set up a company and just think they, you know, they can go with model articles and that works. What are model articles? So model articles are the default articles that companies house will allocate to the company. If you don't have your own bespoke articles of association... Articles of Association are the constitutional document that basically governs the company. And if you don't have your own bespoke ones, you'll just get allocated model articles, which can be fine to start off with. But actually, there are certain provisions of the model articles that aren't that user friendly for a founder. And it might be that you want to amend some of those provisions. So it's actually better to start off with your own bespoke articles and that's what we often recommend to early stage companies is that they look to implement their own bespoke articles and um, we've got a great pre-seed template that we start from and so we can actually produce them very efficiently and it's a very kind of cost effective way of doing it and we just change certain provisions of the model articles that it just means that it's a little bit more flexible founders and and often what people make the mistake of doing is when they come to issue new shares, because obviously when you're a founder, one of the things you're trying to do is get investment into the company. One of the main ways of doing that is through equity and issuing shares to investors. So an investor will give you money, you will issue them shares. And in order to do that, you have to basically go through a what's called the preemption process. And that's kind of offering your other shareholders the same rights of participation in that investment round or disapplying the preemption rights. And it can just get quite administratively burdensome, particularly if you end up with a large shareholder base and you're doing various rounds of investment. So there can be some practical ways in which you can streamline your preemption process because there's also a preemption process um, under the Companies Act as well. But you can disapply that in your articles. The other thing as well is you might be bringing on somebody else to help you grow the business. And what you want to do is incentivize that person. So often founders will just think, oh, yeah, I can just issue them some shares. But actually, it might be better to hold off issuing them shares and maybe give them the option to have shares at a future date. And the way you can do that is through an option agreement. And they basically get a right to a certain amount of shares. But in order to get that, they have to have basically met a certain milestone. So you might have certain targets that this person has to achieve in terms of growing the business. And you know, once they hit the first target, they get a certain portion of that, the shares. Once they hit the next target, they'll get the next portion. And that's a really good way of making sure that they're still incentivized. But if they only do a certain portion, you've basically protected yourself as founders and protected the company so that they don't get all the rights to the shares. Yeah, amazing. And then, for example, going to company's house, I was speaking to somebody yesterday who I said it's £12 and 12 minutes and you become a company director. Is there anything from a legal perspective that isn't flagged then and there that somebody needs to do? Or are you okay just to get going? You can certainly incorporate a company yourself. We do have many clients that come to us and they've already done the incorporation side of things. But what I would say is what people haven't thought about is, you know, firstly, 
when you do become a director of a company, you have certain director's duties and these are fiduciary duties. So you need to bear in mind that as a director of a company, it's not just, oh, yeah, I'm just a director of a company. It's just a name. It's very much more than that. You've got fiduciary duties to the company and its members as a whole. So you really need to consider that when you're acting on behalf of the company, that you're acting in the best interests of the company and its members as a whole. So that's really important. The other thing, and this is more of a practical thing, is that when people incorporate a company, they'll just think, oh, actually, yes, I'll I'll just incorporate 100 shares of £1 each. But what you need to think about is that might be completely fine if you're thinking that you're going to be the only shareholder, the only director going forward. But if you're actually looking to grow the business and get investment, when you get more investment, if you think about the fact that you'll have to issue more shares, you're going to end up with a very large share capital. So say you started with 100 shares, but then you've actually got to issue another, I don't know, 900,000 shares, you're going to end up with a share capital of 900,100, which is very, very large. And from a practical perspective, it's very difficult to accommodate that. And this ties into the accountancy side of things as well. An accountant would also suggest that you don't go with such a large share capital. So what you need to think about is having quite a small nominal amount per share. So you kind of start off with penny shares or tenth of a penny shares and that just helps you manage the the share capital from an administrative perspective. What I would say is whenever you are thinking about growing the company and there being more shareholders, I would put a shareholders agreement in place as soon as you can because it's just really important in terms of managing the governance of the company and how the company's run and making sure all shareholders are signed up to that agreement and that everybody's bound by the same terms. And what should a founder accept that they can't do themselves when it comes to the legal side? I'd say drafting the documents. So, you know, you might be able to put together some very simple board minutes, but actually there's quite a lot to think about when you're doing board minutes. You need to cover things like declaration of interests, which a lot of people don't even do. They literally just put the items that they're discussing at the meeting. But it's important that when you have a board meeting, every director considers whether they've got a conflict of interest in the matters to be discussed at the meeting. And that should be noted in the board minutes. And if there's no interest to be declared, then that should be noted. And then, yeah, just considering the quorum requirements, because a lot of people don't even give that any consideration. So the quorum requirements is what number of directors do you need to be present at the meeting in order for the meeting to be quorum, and therefore in order for the directors to be able to vote on the matters at the meeting. And any advice on how to outsource or find a legal partner, given it is fairly fundamental that you have one? Well, just come to ignition, really. <laughs> <laughs> Good question. I think from from a company's perspective, I would always recommend that you look for a law firm that's regulated by the SRA, which is the Solicitors Regulation Authority. I'd always check that they've got a certain level of insurance cover, that, you know, professional indemnity cover. That's important. But then You also need to look at the experience of the lawyers there and make sure that they've got the right skill set for what you need and understand the business that you're in, because that can be invaluable, particularly from an early stage company's perspective. And is there a ballpark budget that someone should, when they're founding a company, factor in to Mm. cover legal costs? With legal advice, it, it very much depends on on the client and how much or how little advice they need. But the key things that you want to be covered are, depending on the company, you'd probably want some sort of template, non-disclosure agreement or confidentiality agreement. You would want articles of association, a shareholders agreement, assuming that there's more than one shareholder. You'll have corporate authorizations, which are your board minutes, shareholder approvals to implement certain things that you're doing. Then you may need a template employment agreement or consultancy agreement. And that's actually quite important because even if you don't have any employees at present, you may have somebody that's, you know, advising you or just providing some services to the company. And what you need to make sure is in that agreement, it covers, yes, the services that they're going to be provided and what fee you're going to pay them. You also want to include in their confidentiality and potentially some restrictive covenants around Mm non-competition. But you also want to ensure that you've got an IP assignment because this person is going to be helping you develop something for your company and it should be the company that owns any IP that's developed for the business or the product. So you need to make sure that the consultant or advisor basically assigns any IP rights to the company and that can be built in in that 
agreement. So that's, that is important. And it's something that many, many, many people miss, actually. And when it comes to the legal side of running a company, how much time should somebody think they need to dedicate towards it? Yeah, that, that's a very good question because you can actually have some months where you really don't need that much time at all. But if you are gearing up to a funding round, for example, you actually need to think about quite a lot of legal documents. So I think it probably depends on what stage in the cycle you're at. But even if you don't have anything pressing going on, what it might be helpful to do is just kind of go, OK, once a month, I'm just going to sit down and think, what have I got coming up in the next few weeks? Do I need to get a lawyer involved? Yeah, no, amazing. And then once you're up and running, are there things to be aware of down the track that, that people should consider? And do legalities change with scale? Yeah, I mean, in terms of when you're getting more shareholders on board, then yes, when you get employees on, on board, obviously, there's obligations that you need to meet from an employer perspective. I, I'm not an employment lawyer, but sort of making sure that you offer pension schemes, etc. But then also, once you get to a certain point in the cycle, you might think, oh, actually, you know, we're looking to exit the company. So you might be thinking about a listing of the company, which you know, is normally several years away. But that brings up about a whole load of different legal requirements because being a listed company is very different from being a private limited company. So, yes, there are. But actually, the basics of running a company is the same, whatever, you know, you've, you've got a company, you've got to adhere to certain things, you've got to accounts to do, you know, certain filings to make on a regular basis. Great, thank you. And in this mini series of how to start up, we're covering an overview of HR recruiting, accounting, and as well as legal in this episode. Do you have any thoughts about how they are all linked together? And what order to tackle them in? Yes. I mean, the accounting side, we work very closely with the financial tax accountancy advisors of companies. And actually, we have a sister company, Ignition Financial, which provides accountancy and tax and other financial advice. And actually, this is, is quite important to make sure that the legal and the accountancy side are aligned. The reason being, firstly, your accountants will advise you on your share capital, as I mentioned earlier. And it's important to make sure that the accountants are on board with the amount of share capital you're, you're going to have and everything's tied up from the legal and accountancy side in that regard. But also when you start doing fundraising, you might have investors that are looking to get SEIS or EIS tax relief. And there are actually certain regulations surrounding that and there's a process that needs to be followed and it's important that your lawyers are aware that you're trying to do that but also the order in which things need to happen because essentially you need to make sure that your funds come in before you issue shares and a lot of people aren't aware of that so it's actually really good to make sure you have your legal and accountancy advisors talking. Then in terms of the HR and recruitment side of things that probably comes a little bit further down the line once you're trying to bring on certain advisors certain key management and it might be that your HR advisors have ideas as to how to incentivize those key management personnel because it might be that they come up with a package whereby it's not just monetary but also they get some equity they're part of the employee share option pool for example so they do all link in quite nicely amazing thank you and just lastly is there any piece of golden advice that you would like to offer a new founder when it comes to the legal side of starting a company? I would just say, make sure that you, you thoroughly think through everything, set aside some time to consider what legal advice you might need. Particularly if you have another founder, it's actually very important to think about your relationship with that founder. And it's very much, I always relate it to getting married, whilst you might not want to consider the possibility of divorce when you're all very happy and excited about this new beginning. The reality is it could be a situation you end up in. So it's really important to make sure that you have everything in order and there is a mechanism between you and your co-founders in the event that something, God forbid, does go wrong and you can find a way forward. You know, as a founder myself, what I would say is don't be put off by doing your own thing. If you have a great idea, why not give it a go? If you've got the means to do it, I, I would just go for it. It might be daunting at that time, but actually it's the best thing I've ever done. Well, I love the fact that you were working in the city and now you're working in a mountain. Yeah, exactly. Working yeah, On a mountain, I should say. Exactly. And, you know, I'm 
I'm very renowned for doing conference calls on chairlifts really? in a normal world when the chairlifts are running. But oh, yeah, I, I have done many a conference call from a chairlift. It's very so, good use of time. Um, yeah, don't be surprised. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Helen. That's brilliant. Thanks to Helen, I now understand a little more about what I should be doing now, next or never as a new founder when it comes to the legal side of starting a company. If you'd like to contact Helen, either for Wi-Fi enabled airport transfers to amazing ski resorts or legal advice, you will find all of her details in the show notes along with a recap of all the advice that she has shared. Thank you for listening to How to Start Up. I hope these conversations offer you some confidence, encouragement and reassurance that you're on the right track. If you've enjoyed this podcast, I'd be so appreciative if you were to rate, review and subscribe as it will really help other people starting a company discover it. Thank you.